My name is Harriet Nyapidi. I'm a member of All Saints. I a member of Anglican Flames. I attend a 9.30 service. I, I just want to thank the Lord for this time. Uh, let's open with a word of prayer. I know my maestra has prayed, but let's commit what we are going to share again into the hands of the Lord. Father, we give you glory. We give you praise. I thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us the opportunity to see this day. We do not take it for granted. We are forever grateful. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you have purpose that we may be on this call at a time like this. Lord, I want to commit each and everyone on this call and those that will join even later. Father, I pray that you speak to us. I pray, King of glory, that I may not speak any word of my own, but only that which you have purpose. I pray, Lord, that your word may come, Lord, to, to fulfill the purpose for which you have sent it, that we may be able to walk according to your purpose, that we may be able to walk in faith, that we may be able to know you and understand you and know that there isn't any price that we can pay to buy our salvation, but just the blood of Jesus. Lord, I want to thank you, Lord, for you called us. You called us and you said our sins will not be remembered anymore. And you cleanse us with the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we stand here because you have saved us. We stand here because you have loved us. We stand here because you have called us and you have loved us with an everlasting love. Lord, that gives us the courage to call you Abba Father. That gives us the courage to come before your throne of grace, knowing there is nothing else that can wash away our sins but just the blood of Jesus. Lord, I surrender your children into your hand this time. Father, we pray that you cleanse us. Forgive us, Lord, what we have done this day, what we have spoken this day that does not glorify your name. I pray, King of glory, that you wash us in the blood blood of your son, Jesus Christ, that we may be fit for your kingdom, that our services, our work of salvation may not be in vain, but Lord, because of the grace and the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, that we may be ready for your kingdom. For your word say you come to take a church without spot or wrinkle. Help us, King of glory, that we may be without spot, without wrinkle, that we may be fit for your kingdom. Lord, at this time, I decrease as you increase. I pray that you speak through me and use me, Lord, to the glory and honor of your name. I thank you, King of glory, for your love, for your mercies that are new every morning. May your name alone be glorified. May you May alone God. be lifted up. May you alone be worshipped. Because, Lord, you are more than enough. You are our everything. Be exalted in all that we are going to do, all that we are going to listen to this day, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I, I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody who is on this call and thank especially uh, the leadership of the cathedral for giving me this opportunity to share the word of God. I do not take it for granted. I take it as a very big honor to be given a forum. Some of us who come from the Pentecostal background, we know that some of those those altars, some of those pastors will never give you to, to speak on, on, on their altar anyhow. So I do not take this just like something small. I know it's a big thing and I want to say thank you. May the good Lord bless you. Yes, as, as Mama Esther prayed, prayed for me and through the, the scripture, our topic for today is man made as the righteousness of God. And the theme verse comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. I want to start it from verse 16 so that we have a bit of a context. It would be good to start from verse 12, but let me start from 16. But when you go back, you can read from 12 up to 21 so that you get the context of the scripture. So verse 16 says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God 
who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses on them to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's, a, it's good that I'm speaking when we already know what righteousness is. A, a number of speakers have already talked about this. But um, one thing that is very clear is which we should know about righteousness that is that righteousness is one of the chief attributes of God as portrayed in the Hebrew Bible. It is a righteousness is about our ethical conduct. For example, what, what do we call ethical? What in the, in the local language, in our everyday life, we will say something that is normal, that is healthy, that is logical, that does not offend anybody. That is what is righteous. And uh, when we read in, in Psalm, it says, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So whatever you do that you will know that offends somebody or offends the Lord, that is wicked. So the, the opposite of righteous is wickedness. And in our own works, in our own thinking, we know, we know what wickedness is. So for this day, we want to talk about righteousness, not just our own righteousness, but the one that we have got because of the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God. A righteous person is a person who is moral, who is upright, who follows or does what is right. This is the person who lives in the right way. So I would say that definition of righteousness is a state or condition of being declared upright or being declared moral or just. So righteousness is, is not something that I would take in my own eyes. I'm not going to come before you and tell you, ah, for me, I am righteous. But when people look at me, let, let's, let's bring it home. At my place of work, at my home, I should be approved by the people I live with that they are able to say, eh, as for Harriet, she is like this and this and this. So whatever statement they will give about you, whether they will say Harriet is a very wicked person, that definitely means you are not righteous even in the eyes of the Lord because if man can see that I am unrighteous or I am wicked, then I would not have the audacity of claiming myself to be righteous. So what then is the righteousness of God? Because our theme said man made us the righteousness of God, not my own righteousness. Because also the Bible tells us that our own righteousness is like filthy rags. But this time we want to look at the righteousness of God. And we've already said being righteous in the eyes of God means God himself has approved, has approved you as being righteous. So one way that we become righteous, first of all, is to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Because when, when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. The sin that separates us from the Lord. Hello. Somebody mute. Isaiah 59 tells us that our sin separates us from the Lord so that he cannot listen to us. So we are only justified righteous by the Lord himself, meaning sin is not standing in the way. The sin that had separated us from the Lord, he sent the Lord Jesus Christ to reconcile us to himself. So if we are to let this, this portion sink, to consider it and meditate about it, about my sin being forgiven, about Harriet, about 
Mama, Mama Esther about whether he's on this call, being reconciled to the Lord by the death of Jesus Christ. That is a big privilege that makes us know that we are not just anything, but we are so important in the sight of the Lord because he has forgiven our sin. He wiped it away. He does not remember it anymore. So <clears throat> we do not become righteous. We do not become righteous by, by works, by the things we do. It is God himself who approves us. So there's no amount of money that I will give, maybe in the church, maybe in, in the community, maybe to the poor. It doesn't mean that if I give so much or I do what in the eyes of the world is good, then I am considered righteous. That is not the righteousness of God. So there are three things that I want us to look at when we think about God's righteousness. We must know that the righteousness of God is not earned. It is given through the exchange. The righteousness that man, you and I, is given by the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not buy it. It is given through exchange. The unique thing about God's righteousness and God seeing, uh, seeing you as approved is is that there is not enough you could ever do to earn God's approval. There's nothing I will do that will make God say, okay, now Harriet has given so much, she can now be called righteous. Not that. It is something that God took in upon himself and gave an exchange, an exchange with his son, Jesus Christ. This is not only unique, it is also a relief because it takes off the burden from us. Imagine if the weight of trying to go through life, wondering if you ever had enough, enough to do to earn God's approval. I can imagine how the world would be in chaos if we were working to make sure that I have done something too big that will make God call me righteous. This is not what makes us righteous. So God has saved us this pressure so that we don't have to, to carry around heavy loads trying to, to please man. I have to give such and such amount so that I am accounted righteous. That is not the case. Our righteousness was given through an exchange. Here is how the exchange works. Christ takes on our sin. Actually, the Bible says he became sin and exchange our sin so that we are, we are called righteous, so that we may receive the righteousness. So to be declared righteous in God's sight, you must be willing to put all your sin on Christ and take up his righteousness. How do I put all my sin on Christ? The Bible tells us that the blood of Jesus is what cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I know sometimes it is hard for us to, to think about that because it sounds too good to be true. But thankfully, this is true, that I have to surrender my sin Surrender the weight of my sin, bring it to the cross of Jesus Christ, and I take the righteousness of God, which is given by the Lord Jesus Christ. You do not have to go and move a mountain in order for you to be righteous. It is very simple. You have to accept and surrender the weight of that sin, surrender the weight of that sin to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So what have I said? The righteousness of God is approved by him and we do not earn it. It is given by the exchange of the blood of Jesus Christ. And also, secondly, this righteousness is not bought because it is already paid for. I don't have to buy. I don't have to pay a certain amount of money in order for me to, to be right. We, we know that chorus, Jesus paid it all. He paid for my sin. He paid for your sin. If Jesus had not paid it all, I think I said this one time again, some of us would not have qualified to be the children of God. We, may not, we wouldn't have had the, that amount of money to pay for our sins. So as a wonder aspect of God's righteousness is that 
It really doesn't cost you anything, but it costs Jesus everything. In order for me to be righteous, it did not cost me as Harriet anything so big, but it cost Jesus everything, including his life. The fact is that the price of your righteousness or my righteousness is so high that all the money in this world could never have even paid for it. But the good news is that Jesus paid it all. So it makes it easy for us to afford this righteousness. It has already been paid for. Romans 5 verse 9 said, so now that we have been made righteous by his blood, we can be even more certain that we will be saved from God's wrath through him. The privilege is given to you and I to choose whether to take this righteousness or say, as for me, I will continue with in my wicked ways. And then after continuing, you live in fear, knowing that the wrath of God is coming. But God has been so, 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 so good to us. And he, he justified us by sending the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are declared righteous and justified because of the blood of Jesus Christ. There is nothing else that can make us all again. There is nothing that can make me righteous except the blood of Jesus Christ. I, we remember that hymn, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And sinners plugged beneath that flood and lose all their guilty stain. Jesus paid the price so that you and I may not live in guilt. The devil may go and, and accuse us, as we know the Bible says he's accuser of the brethren, will come and accuse you of something that you did long ago. But did you repent? Did you bring that, that sin, that guilt at the feet of Jesus Christ? and surrender. Did you repent about it? If you did, then you know that you are free. The blood of Jesus Christ sets us free. For God presented Christ as the atoning sacrifice through faith in his blood in order to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in the forbearance, he had passed over the sin committed beforehand. That is, that is Romans 3.25. God went ahead of us before even Harriet was thinking of how big the weight of her sin is. God sent Jesus Christ. So through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, I attain righteousness. You attain righteousness. You and I were guilty of sin. Yet there was a savior who came down from heaven and shed his blood so that so that all our guilty, all our sins, all the stain of sin is washed away, washed away, and then we are declared righteous. Remember I said earlier that we are approved or declared righteous by the Lord. And the Bible tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then this is the moment right now that you are righteous in God's sight. All the guilt stains are gone, paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ and applied to your account so that your sinful account is now paid in full. There is no red if you, if you look at your bank account. It is all in green. There's no red that is showing that you are demanded anything. Just by you taking a step of accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just by you acknowledging that there is nothing you can do to save yourself, but it's only the grace of God that saves you. It's only the grace of God that saves man and makes man righteous. So we must know that we can only gain this righteousness by having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, by accepting him as our Lord and Savior. And after doing that, then we have to walk a walk of faith. It doesn't mean that because now the blood of Jesus is sufficient, Harriet can do anything. Man can do anything they want. After all, the sin is already paid for. We have to continue walking a walk of faith. We do not have to go back and carry our sin and say, after all, Jesus died for me. I can do anything. Like we, we, we know the grace gospel. 
we have to continue walking a righteous walk, walking a walk of faith. The third thing I want to say about man being made as righteousness of God is the righteousness that God gives us is not temporary. It is eternal. I want to connect that to the grace gospel. <clears throat> I must admit that sometimes as Christians, we struggle with sin. We struggle with repentance. We struggle with forgiveness. We struggle with this God's righteousness. And after something has happened, you, you like reach in a state of confusion. You, you're like, this is too big for me to repent of. This is, this is so and so has done something so big for me to, to, to forgive. This reminds me of something that happened in my, my house uh, in, a, in December. One of my, my relatives burst out and came and told me, yeah, we have been relatives, but from today on, we are not relatives. And from today on, there is no more forgiveness. I will not forgive you. I don't want you to forgive me. From now, we are enemies. And I am walking away from your house. I will never see your face and you'll never see my face. Then I was, I, I had a lot of pain in my heart. This is a child who has a very long future. And this is a believer who does not believe that there is forgiveness. Who does not believe that the Lord Jesus paid it all. You, you might wonder what could have happened that caused all that Cause, uh, you know, your relative to tell you from today on no forgiveness and no relationship. It's just about the, the, the home chores. Just about telling somebody, can you make for me this and this? And somebody burst out like that. Meaning there was unforgiveness that was already bottled somewhere. So what I am seeing now is just a, a reflection of what somebody has kept for so long. And this is what happens to us Christians. I commit something very bad today. And I think, no, but everybody does it, you know. Uh, after all, Jesus died for me. After all, Jesus died for us. And then one, two, three days, you, you start living like nothing has happened. You've not repented. You've not put the relationship right with the person who has wronged you or the person you have wronged. And now we start walking like nothing has happened. So the next time something happens, that anger that we had stored that we did not repent of will come up. And it rubbishes the blood of Jesus Christ. It rubbishes the righteousness that God has given us. So what do I need to do as a Christian? I need to walk a walk of faith. I need to understand the word of God. I need to know that God forgave me too much. So there's nothing a human being is going to do to me that I cannot forgive. Thank God for some of us who talk. There are people who sit with a lot of things in their heart. But uh, some of us who speak a lot, even when something is paining you so much, you want to share it with somebody. <clears throat> for this that happened in my, my home, I had to share it. I had to share it with somebody who is a friend to this daughter of mine so that they can speak to her and make sure that we amend relationship because I'm not going to pretend that she is the one who is not forgiving me so I am righteous. No, because forgiveness is both ways. The Bible tells us we know the Lord's prayers. Forgive so that you are also forgiven. So as Christians, we do not have to sit and wait that because so-and-so has wronged me, because nobody has seen me doing this, I am not going to repent. We would be living a hypocritical life. So we must learn to surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. One thing that we must understand is that God's declaration of righteousness over you is not temporal, it's eternal, but it is not a, it's not a, a, a passport for you to go sinning every day. In the courtroom, they, when you, the, the lawyers have their language, they can dismiss a case with pre prejudice. When a case is dismissed totally, they will never mention it again. That file is closed and is gone. And that is what God does. When the Lord Jesus forgives us, 
when he sets me free, when he says he has reconciled me, when the Bible says that man has been reconciled to God, it means I am totally reconciled. He's not going to say part of the sin is not forgiven. So it's up to the Christian, it's up to man to pick up and move and know that I am living a forgiven life because Christ has set me free. Hallelujah. I, I want us to look at another scripture, Romans chapter 3, verse 21, 24. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophet testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. This, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all, not to some. There is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. We always quote this scene, all have seen and fallen short of the glory. So we should not just stop by quoting the other part that is, that is very, very sweet in our tongue. But we must know that this righteousness is given through Jesus, Jesus Christ. And it's given for all, all, all include all. Mm. So we must learn that God's justification or declaration of righteousness over your life has made you right in his sight, both now and forever. It is one of the most important things to know about the righteousness of God. Your problem of original sin, that sin that separated us, has been dealt with. And you are not only righteous, righteousness of God, but you become very special possession. You have a special place in God's heart. Remember the word says we are the apple of his eye. So mm. now that God has forgiven us, does it mean I should continue sinning? Does it mean I can't do anything because the righteousness to, that God has given us is permanent? No. I said it earlier that after we have received this righteousness, we have to continue walking a walk of faith. We have to live the word of God. We have to be the living word. Be the living word that when your children, when your neighbors, when your colleagues look at you, they see you portraying Jesus Christ. So how does the righteousness of God apply when we sin? It's very important to us to understand the role sin plays in our relationship with God. When sin comes, when I sin and I do not repent, that sin still separates the connection, separates my relationship with God. So does it mean I'm going to live a separated life with Christ and think I will benefit, I will go to eternal life, and yet after sinning, I remain cut? It's like electricity. When there is a short circuit somewhere, there will be no power there will be no light on the other side. This is exactly what happens in our relationship with God. Sin is what cuts the connection, the relationship between man and God. So the sin that separated you from God, that would have condemned you to an eternity apart from, apart from what was the original one. We have the, the opportunity to take it to God in repentance. Because no one is going to say me, I do not sin. If you say I do not sin, is I think you be a liar. The Bible says if we if we say we do not sin, then we make God a liar. Because many times we've fallen short of his glory. But one thing that is clear is that the door is open. The door is open for us to go back. It's like a child in the home. If a child has done something wrong and they hide, you know the story of the workers. I think this is a common story we know. When one of the workers broke a vessel in the home and hid it from the master, the other colleague kept using that every time to torture this one who had broken the, the, the vessel. Every time he wants his clothes to be washed, he will bring to the person who had broken the glass and say, if you do not wash for me, I'll report you to the master. And he would wash. If 
If you do not do this, I'll report you, report you to the master. But then the servant learned eventually that I just need to go to the master myself, present this case, ask for forgiveness so that I have a new living. And indeed, after doing that, the relationship was mended. The same applies to us. If we cut this relationship by sinning and we do not repent, the enemy will always accuse you using that. Using that same sin which you did years ago. So you remember the other day you stole this amount of money. And because you are guilty of not repenting, you will always live in condemnation. So for us to achieve, for us to be declared righteous in the eyes of God by the Lord himself, we need to learn to take everything to the Lord. We need to live a life of repentance. We need to live a life of forgiveness so that our relationship is fluid between us and God. That's why Paul writes in Romans that therefore, we know that that is a common verse, Romans 8.1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Mark the word for those who are in Christ. There's no condemnation. So we are not going to just brag around and say, ah, as for me, I can do this because there is no condemnation. No, it is being in Christ and walking a daily Christian walk that makes us not to be condemned in any way. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 19, I want to read it. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. This is what Paul was saying. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This is what I keep doing. Paul was a man like us. Just like you and I, you want to do the things that the Bible requires of you. You want to walk in love. You want to walk in forgiveness. You want to walk a repentant life. But you find yourself that you are not doing what you really want to do. But the things you do not want to do are the ones you do. Let's, let's take an example of what, what we talk a lot of, the corruption in Uganda or in the world. Most of these people who are doing this act are Christians, are people who have been justified by the Lord as righteous. But then they find themselves going to pick this from the government coffers. And after picking, you have this pride of, ha, huh, how will they see me? So you, you, you keep this money in your account and keep pulling it little, but in your heart you say, ha, huh, I think this is wrong. And you begin debating with sin. You, be, you begin debating with the enemy and the enemy keeps telling you, no, everyone does it. Last time, don't, don't you remember so-and-so did it? Don't you remember so-and-so took all that money and no one got to know about it? No, it's okay. Just, just continue. And by and by, your conscience becomes seared and it is no longer a, a problem. The next time, you're pulling the next. You've not repented. You are no longer remorse because you ignored what the word of God says. So we need to keep this relationship fluid so that we do not find ourselves doing the things we do not want to do. We need to walk a walk of faith. Paul was saying, as Paul said in the verse we have read, he acknowledges that this body, you will have struggles with your sinful nature. However, that struggle does not disqualify your right standing with God. In fact, one of the meaning of the word of condemnation is the penalty that comes down after standing a trial. Because you are the righteousness of God, you have stood trial and been found not guilty, and there is now no eternal penalty. So have you taken this case to the Lord and told him, I have found myself again doing this, God forgive me. Or you are riding on the line says that the righteousness that God has given me is eternal. It will never reverse. So does that give you alliances to sin? Because your sin have been forgiven. Remember hinting somewhere that your original sin was forgiven and God counted you righteous. So we have to keep coming back to God. So it does not give me alliances to sin. I would say that the person who views use God's grace or declaration of righteousness as alliances to sin 
has no understanding of justification or grace. If we think that I already have alliances to sin, then you've not understood what grace is. I would wonder if they have ever truly received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because if you have received the Lord and you are having a closer walk with him, whatever sin you have committed, you will find it very hard for you to go before the Lord. You say, I need to first put this right before I can do A, B, C, and D. So we do not have alliances to sin. We do not have alliances to continue sinning because there is a penalty to sin. There is a penalty. One of it that is very clear is that the relationship between you and God, the relationship between I and God is cut, cut because of the sin that we commit. So the other side of the coin is, the other side of the coin of sin is that there are consequences. And the other, the other side is that there is forgiveness. So you choose which side. Are you going to choose forgiveness? Or you are going to say, no, it was already done once. Jesus paid it also. He paid for yesterday, today, and forever. I can continue sinning. Then you might be having a question in your heart that, so now, Harriet, you are talking about righteousness. How do I become more righteous? Can I become more righteous than I am now? This is a big question. It's a good question. But I would think the question that we should be having should be, how should I become more like Christ? How can I live a Christ-like life? Because the righteousness that we are talking about is given by God. Once you are declared right with God or approved by God, you don't become more right again. You are righteous, period. So if, if, if I were to consider this question, I would, I would ask it in a different way. How do I become more like Christ? Our goal as believers should be to look act, think, behave, live just like Christ did. When we do this, we will reflect to the world, we will reflect to our surrounding who Christ is and what he means to us. So then I would say, for us to live a Christian life, for us to be more righteous, we need to be like Christ. We need to live a Christian life. And we need to ask God to give us a new heart, ask God to remove a heart of stone, ask God to remove this heart that keeps pushing us to sin and gives us a heart of flesh. A heart of flesh will force us to repent, will force me to go and repent because I am having a Christ-like heart. I think we know that about a heart of stone in 36 verses 26 to, to 27. So we need to live a Christ-like life. We need to live a life that glorifies the Lord. That's when we will be righteous. We need to point the world to Christ. You're not going to stand on the road and just start saying, accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then you go back to office. I met you on the road telling me about who Christ is. I'm your colleague. Then I go back to office. I meet you and you're doing a totally opposite of what you've been preaching. That would be crucifying Christ for the second time. So may the Lord help us that we may live a Christ-like life. The three things I said. This righteousness is not bought. Being right, man being right, being in the righteousness of God, we cannot buy it and it is permanent. It is just exchange with the blood of Jesus Christ. And I also say the term righteous is commonly referred to as something that you believe is morally right or something that is godly. Given man's opinion, man's opinion alone will not take us anywhere. But our righteousness is approved by God. So today, my friends, you are declared righteous. Now I challenge you to do one thing. Live like it with the help of the Holy Spirit, live like one who has been tried and found not guilty, because that is what you are. We are by faith in Christ and by accepting him 
as our Lord and walking according to the word. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. Lord, we pray that you may help us. Help us, Lord, to be counted among the righteous in your own eyes, not by our works, not by giving, not by pleasing anybody in the world, but may we be counted righteous by faith in Christ Jesus. Father, help us that we may live a surrendered life. Help us that we may live a holy life, that we may walk a walk of faith, that Lord, sin may not stand in our way with you, King of glory, that our relationship with you may be the most important thing that has ever happened to us. Lord, I pray for your children on this call. I know many of us, we have questions in our hearts. We have issues that we feel is too big to carry, but Lord, this day we want to surrender this at the cross. We want to surrender it to you, King of glory, that our spiritual eyes may be open to understand that Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid all our sins. We only need to come to him and surrender, that we may know that Jesus is calling us to himself, that we may take this baggage, that we may take this burden to the cross, and he will carry it all, and he will give us the grace to walk a Christian walk, to live a Christ life walk. Father, I surrender into your hand that you help us to know you, help us to read your word, help us to live a repentant life because we cannot walk this life without you. Lord, I thank you. I give you glory for I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, my dear sister in the Lord, my daughter, I believe. We give you honor, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the life of Harriet. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the word he gave us this evening. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that she has been so faithful to serve you. And this evening she has fed us very well, reminding us, Lord Jesus, that we cannot say that we have sinned. When we say we have no sin, we are telling lies. And another scripture, it says that I have kept him, your word that I may not sin against you. So by keeping the word of God in our hearts, by knowing what he has done on the cross, he helped us to be transformed. And he make us righteous, not of what we have done, but of what God has done. Glory to God. Thank you so much, my dear. May God bless you so much, Madam Harriet. May God continue to anoint you as you serve him. May the Lord bless your family and everyone you love. May the Lord continue to reveal himself how strong he is into your life. Thank you so much for this word. Thank you so much for reminding us everything. We have been, it's true, we have been uh, listening to many servants of God, speaking about the righteousness, speaking about our consecration, generally speaking about a man who was born a sinner. But then when we give our life to the Lord, we become children of God. So we put on the righteousness, which is not of ours. And another song saying, naked I come to you. Before the Lord, we are naked. Our garments are filthy. He does not look at what we have done. When we repent, he forgives us. And the, the word of God tells us that he does not forget. For, he does not remember. He forgives and forgets what we have done. What a mighty God we serve. Thank you so much, my sister. It seems so good. We give you honor. We give you praise, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the word which was shared this evening. May we be humble enough to say, Lord, forgive us. 
where we don't walk right, where we are not trusting you enough, when we, where, where we are not following your ways, where we are not doing what we are supposed to do. Forgive us where we don't trust you as we should. Forgive us, Lord, as children of man born in a sin that we cannot stand before you as. So, Lord, Lord, we ask you to forgive us. We cannot stand before the Lord. We need his righteousness in us so that when the Lord God see us, you will see his son, Jesus Christ. What a privilege we have. What a mighty God we serve. He's so good to us. So this evening, we want to surrender everything to him. We surrender our fears. We surrender our unbelief. We surrender all unrighteousness in us. We surrender every sinful nature in us. And we pray that he continues to transform us and make us righteous as he is and he desires. So my father, my God, thank you for the word which was spoken. Thank you for the word in the scripture. Thank you for the cross of Jesus. Thank you for the blood which cleans us and make us whole. It is written that we cannot, we cannot please you, that the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. So deal with our flesh, my Father, my God. Deal with the, with the desire of the flesh. Deal with the desire of the you know, of eyes. Deal with everything that does not Please you, my Father, deal with us and change us. Help us to know who you are, a great God, a merciful Savior, King of King and Lord of Lord. Reveal yourself and your righteousness in us that we may continue to be able to stand before you that we may continue to be able to have a, a, a conversation with you. We know that when Adam and Eve disobeyed you, they could not stand before you. They could no longer have a, um, a, a discussion with you. So it is my prayer this evening, King of Glory, that we shake, we shake off everything that God has not created in us. That will come closer to him that he may remove everything which doesn't please him. To God be glory. I thank God for the opportunity of being together as members of the cathedral, as members of the body of Christ to be together and I say, Lord, we love you so much and we thank you for loving us. It is a joy to be called the children of God. So we continue to depend on him even this evening, even the day to come. We pray for this country, we pray for the cathedral, we pray for the body of Christ, the whole world, we pray for our leaders, the archbishop and all bishops and all our leaders, that we may come closer to you, that we may walk as you want us to walk, my Father, my God, that we may trust you and obey you and continue to tell others who have not come to that faith who do not believe, who still think that 
they can have other gods. So thank you, Lord Jesus, that even in the evening, we are rebuked, we are corrected by your word. Continue to teach us your ways. Continue to reveal your ways to us. We thank you for the servants of God who have prepared the vessels, who have prepared even in our, our cathedral for the word they continue to share with us. We thank you for the people who are blessing us every evening, every morning. We thank you for the administration of the cathedral, for this time of intercession. So Lord, we cannot forget to intercede even for the problem we have right now. We cancel all the plans of the enemy. We ask the Holy Spirit to deal with the spirit behind it. And Lord, we pray that nothing will bring judgment on Uganda. Pray for our children, great children, grandchildren. We pray for members of the family who have not given their life to the Lord. We pray that you continue to remind us that we don't belong here. Continue to remind us, Lord Jesus, that we have a work to do and teach us to do it properly. 